uh, introduce uh, Myra Parkinson uh, this afternoon, CHR speaker. Uh, professor Parkinson is an associate professor of history at SUNY Binghamton. Uh, received his PhD at uh, my alma mater, the University of Virginia, so of course he's got to be great. Uh, 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 professor Parkinson recently authored uh, The Common Cause, Creating Race and Nation in the American Revolution. The book appeared in 2016 and it won the James A. Raleigh Prize for the best book in the history of race relations in the United States, as well as a, you know, I thought it was a very interesting award from a journalism organization, uh, the Association of Educators in Journal Journalism and Mass Communication uh, awarded its best book in the history, history category. Uh, Professor Parkinson was a, a postdoctoral fellow at the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture and has a lot of other uh, impressive uh, awards and fellowships in his uh, in his past, uh, but today he's going to share uh, share his research on the American Revolution and how it caused. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Yes, the the associates, the AEJMC, which is a group I didn't even know existed, or there was a prize until they got an email from them and said, "Hey, great, you won a, a award." Hey, <laughs> wish that happened more often. Okay, uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit about. Um, uh, this big long book that I wrote that came out last year that I've been working on for about 15 years, where it came from and kind of how the project came together and what I think is the sort of the the, um, in, uh, the impact of some of my uh, research. So when I started out, uh, after I finished my exams at the University of Virginia, I knew I vaguely wanted to write something about race and nation making and something in the revolution and, and the idea came from something, sort of something Peter Onuf said, kind of in a seminar, just threw off something about Indians on the backcountry, and I thought, oh, that was really cool. I can't even remember exactly what it was now, but I had no idea where to start, right? I had no which so for the graduate students, if you're if you're thinking about this, I had no idea what I was about to get into, and I I've never had had the courage to go back and look at my dissertation prospectus to see what kind of nonsense I wrote, <laughs> but it wasn't anything like what I did because what I started, I had a big idea, and so I figured, well. I guess I'll just start reading newspapers. And what I found there uh, really blew me away. Uh, so I'll talk just briefly uh, for a, a few seconds about what a newspaper in colonial America is, how it's created, how it's constructed. Uh, and then I want to talk about why I think um, some of the things that I found there in this source that lots of people have looked at before. How could I find something new and something that people have gone over and over and over and over again, right? Looking at newspapers about the revolution is not exactly a uh, fresh ground. So how did I find a little bit of fresh ground? I think I did. Okay, so a newspaper in colonial America is a four-page affair. I'm sure most of you know this stuff, but I figured I'd just tell, talk about it briefly. Here's the Virginia Gazette from 19 July, 1776. So this is, uh, it's a four-page affair. It's one big sheet of paper. It's one, uh, it's, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, outer page and an inner page that's folded over, right? So uh, it comes out once a week, usually. A couple of uh, newspapers come out uh, two or three times a week, but usually it's once a week. So let's just say the paper comes out from the print shop every Wednesday. So what do they do uh, starting Thursday, Friday, Saturday? They, uh, the people working in the shops go to work uh, on the outer sheet, the stuff that goes on the front page and the back page. And now, there is no such thing as the front page as we think about it, Right? That's not where the news is, really, at all. Um, uh, it's, uh, often you would find on the front are essays of either a political, depending on kind of the moment it is, or a literary uh, um, uh, nature, news from London, stuff that might be a little bit older. Um, uh, uh, one of the things I talk about in my book is I, I found this great short story by Nathaniel Hawthorne in, he, in the 1830s that he goes back and looks at old newspapers, American newspapers, and he says, he refers to it as the bed of poppies, right? There's this really sort of soporific kind of lazy <laughs> stuff that goes on the front page of squibs about the pretender and all kinds of nonsense, right? Uh, but not news. Now, by the 1760s and 70s, that's becoming more political, uh, some written by English authors, some written by columnists. The back page is almost exclusively um, advertisements, land for sale, labor wanted, runaway servants, runaway slaves, horses run away, lots of things running away, uh, ships leaving and arriving. And so they would print the front page and they would print the back page. This is the back of this particular uh, uh, issue. And then they would uh, uh, put it up in the rafters and let the outer page dry, right? So, so this would be done 
Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and, and then so hopefully all these issues are drying all over the print shop while the uh, master and most of the journeymen are collecting news to go on the inside of that piece of paper. So while that's happening, they're, they're gathering news. Usually he, but sometimes she, the printer, um, needs about six columns of news every week. Now since there are no reporters or journalists, basically the printer is, is dependent upon what they can gather from ship captains uh, bringing newsletters, things they might have seen on the Atlantic, uh, or interested parties that want to give their correspondence to the printer. That's one method of news gathering. Um, the other method, and this is the middle two pages here, the other way, of course, is the exchanges. And this is really the lifeblood of newspapers in the 18th century. Newspapers travel to other printers for free, usually. Uh, they clip, and, and, and as a result of that, they, uh, newspaper printers clip items from other places and put them in their, uh, in their columns as news from other places. And you see these on these datelines. So if you look at the very uh, far one over here, you see it says New York under the, under the, under the dateline, the very top corner, and then all that falls underneath that is uh, news from New York. And then usually as, as, you, as you go across these two middle pages, you actually go across in time as well. So the freshest news you usually find kind of at the very bottom of the third page here, right? Oldest to newest, right? And so oftentimes you'll see, uh, like a Virginia paper, you'll see, so this is New York, this is, this is um, Philadelphia, Annapolis, and then Williamsburg starts this is This is local news. So the only local stuff is really these kind of columns. And this is those, page, that page is full of the exchanges taken from the Maryland Gazette or or the uh, New York Constitutional Gazette, or uh, the Pennsylvania Evening Post, things like that. Uh, the exchanges are the thing that I have put a lot of thought into. Uh, what does this do? How, how, how does this work? How, how can newspaper exchanges do things that might help make revolutions happen? They're, they are not unlike a modern kind of newswire today, like the AP or the UPR. Now, I am not the first person to look at newspapers in the American Revolution. It's kind of its own cottage industry, going all the way back to the 1770s themselves. Very famously, Harbottle Door uh, uh, kept all the newspapers and then, and then uh, uh, and indexed them and put them on, and now they're on deposit of the Massachusetts Historical Society because he thought at the, very, at, the very, at the very top, when it's happening, that this was a source to, be, to look at. Uh, Historians have all uh, looked at the uh, newspapers to explain how and why they think the revolution happened. For various reasons. Those who think that the, the, the revolution was about ideas, the Balin and Woods of the world, that it's about uh, abstract concepts of consent and, and representation and freedom and all that jazz, uh, paid a lot of attention to the front page, the essays on the front, the things written by English authors, uh, or, uh, or English uh, speakers, and perhaps in the House of Commons, or colonial writers like John Dickinson, or Thomas Jefferson, or Thomas Paine, or John Adams, or James Otis. And that's what causes the revolution. Of course, the other way to explain how things are, uh, why things happen, uh, that, it, that that's not enough, that ideas don't motivate or can't make revolutions happen. Uh, it's not brought on by people's reading, but instead is brought to you by discontent and dissatisfaction that it's common folk, not elite white men, are the ones who force or bring the conflict to a crisis. And where do we find that stuff? On the back page, right? That's where you find the runaway servants ads and the runaway slave ads, the crime reports, the land for sale, and what effect those kinds of things might have uh, in the back country with native peoples or, or immigration intentions created there. The, the, if you want to look at uh, um, uh, that kind of explanation of why the revolution happens, you see the back pages. I, inst I instead decided to pay a lot of attention to the stuff actually on the inside. Now, I'm not the first one to do that either, but I'm not sure other people, other historians have really thought about what the news stories on the inside meant on a continental scale and what those exchanges meant, those very small little paragraphs about a really kind of bland and often um, not all that exciting stories uh, um, uh, when, you, when you look at it uh, at first. It's small kind of paragraphs. Now, I didn't think that that was important either when I first started reading. Uh, now, again, I, I will also say that my much beloved Alderman Library at the University of Virginia is where I did almost all this research. 
And, and uh, for kids out there who are working on, now we have these fancy dancy uh, databases that can, can do some of this, I don't know if Ohio State subscribes to the, to the Redex databases, but I would have never found the story and written this book had I just used the databases. I wouldn't have been able to understand what I was seeing, and I wouldn't have been able to do it if I was just dipping in or doing word searches. It, it took reading it page and frame by frame for me to understand what was going on here, too. So the little old school shout out uh, for, for this. Um, and, and, and I can talk more in the Q&A about why I think the databases can actually be dangerous. Uh, because when I went back and backfilled with some of my research, I found a lot of problems. It's stuff that I knew, okay, I know this is in 11 newspapers. When I do word searches, it comes up as seven. Ooh, that's wrong. Okay, so anyway. Uh, so I started uh, reading them in 1775. And by the summer of 1775, almost every single week of almost all of those newspapers, I found things that I did not expect to find. Uh, stories, lots of them, about African Americans and Native peoples responding to rumors and whispers and threats uh, by British officials uh, all throughout the 13 colonies. They were everywhere, and the amount of these stories was kind of staggering. Now, we recognize now more than ever the importance that African Americans and Indians play to the course and outcomes and legacies of the Revolution. We know that. We know that the Revolutionary War is the largest slave insurrection until the Civil War. We know that American independence was a watershed event for Native people all across the continent. We also know that the Continental Army was the most integrated fighting force the United States would field until the Vietnam War that thousands of African Americans and Indians fought with Washington as well as against him, all that is established. But what I was finding was a little bit different. What I was finding was were stories, sponsored stories, by patriot leaders, and by that I mean political leaders, military leaders, officers in, in either state militias or the Continental Army, or publicity leaders like Payne, but also sort of uh, print and communication leaders about the role that blacks and Indians might play or were playing in the war. And what was important to me was that I was finding the same stories over and over and over again. So I, I live in about a half an hour from Charlottesville, and I would, and I would, I would go through a whole run of, of one newspaper, and then I would go through another run, and then I got to the point when I was doing my research that I could predict what was going to be in the next newspaper. Or I would turn the thing and I said, I bet it's going to be, let's say it's August, it's going to be this, this, or this. Right? So then I would drive home from, my, from the from Alderman Library and i think, well, what the hell does that mean? Like, what, is, what does it mean that I can predict? What, what does it mean that everybody's reading the same thing? What, what kind of effect does that have? How do, we, how do we think about that? So I knew that this story is going to be here, and then bam, there it was. Right? So, so I began to think about the exchanges and what they meant. Why were those stories there? Why were they the same ones? What are they doing there? Who put them there? So my book, The Common Cause, argues that the people who consider themselves patriots put forward an argument that their fellow colonists should listen to them. Their position about what words, slippery words, like liberty or freedom or representation meant, that those are the right definitions of those words, not the British definitions of those words, which were very close. British ideas about liberty and American ones could very, very easily overlap. So how do you define and draw distinctions between them? For the imperial crisis from 1765 to 1774, uh, patriot leaders made a lot of political and constitutional arguments that good colonists who liked freedom, right, we like freedom, uh, should resist British efforts to take those freedoms away. Uh, colonists who like freedom should fight to protect it. It was a celebration of masculine, virtuous, selfless action that sees a passivity in the face of this kind of destruction as a problem and sees conspiracy and treachery everywhere and you would take steps to resist it. And as I say in the book, this is what I, I kind of talk about as the, the concept of the American Revolution, right? From 1765 to 1774, right? This is what's going on here, sort of this the larger argument, this kind of version of this common cause or this, uh, this, uh, this appeal is, is, is what we would like to think encapsulates the entire common cause argument of the American Revolution. But I think there's something changes. And a quote from John Adams in 1815 stands in for this. It, it, it frames Balin's book in 1967 
Ideological origins, if you go to page one, right there before the text starts, Balin quotes this, right? What do we mean by the revolution? The revolution was in the minds of the people, and this was affected from 1760 to 1775. Then, then everything stops. <laughs> but then, and I, what I was looking at was very different. Then the shooting, once the shooting starts, the American Revolution, this one appeal, this, this, this a reason that you should follow us and, and, and follow our definitions of these slippery words, changes once the American Revolution becomes the Revolutionary War. Um, in that quote of Adams, he also then goes on to say this, the war, that was no part of the revolution. It was only an effect and a consequence of it. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> uh, he's wrong. Sorry, John, he's wrong. It's not just that he's wrong. He's being very mendacious when he says that in 1815 for a reason. And historians for too long have been enthralled with that quote and that notion. When the shooting started, I argue, everything changed. Especially the argument for why people should support the patriots. Because the common cause appeal changed. And it better have, because now it was more necessary than ever. Now you had to call on people to put their bodies on the line on their, fa their families and their fortunes on the line to defend this slippery definition, your definition of liberty. Remember, the British have their own concept of this. I have a, a buddy um, who's in the very last process of publishing his book on a British version of the common cause. So it's, a, it's almost the mirror opposite of um, uh, 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 thesis from my book. Uh, it says that, that uh, they are uh, developing their own one, and it's very, there's a lot of overtones to the whole thing. So, so this is a very, very tricky thing to do. The common cause was always about union, making it common. And the union was almost catastrophically fragile all throughout the imperial crisis. Spoiler alert, it always will be, right? Uh, but how do you get Southerners to support Boston? How do you get backcountry settlers to support people living on the Atlantic coast? How do you get Quakers to support Congregationalists? In the 1770s, settlers from Connecticut and Pennsylvania are fighting a small-scale civil war in the Wyoming Valley. Uh, in the 1770s, settlers from Virginia and Pennsylvania are fighting a small-scale civil war in the Pittsburgh region. In the 1770s, settlers from New Hampshire and New York are fighting a small-scale civil war in the Green Mountains. Both Carolinas are battling their own internal strife with regulator movements, and I haven't talked about slavery yet. Or the potentially hundreds of thousands of people who think that the crown is right. So the fault lines are deep, and the fault lines are real. No one, and I mean no one, expects the 13 colonies to stick together. Certainly not the British, right? If we, if we look at Franklin's cartoon from 1763, Join or Die, it's or die, right? The choice is or die almost every time. It's the longest of long shots. And I think probably now, it potentially could be now more than ever. So the common cause argument evolved because I think it had to. To embrace not just positive notions of commonwealth virtue and consent, self-government, but also about fear and prejudice and exclusion. Which brings me to the stories that I was finding in the newspapers. What were they about? British agents spiriting up, tampering with, whispering to, conspiring with, some version of those verbs. Slaves and Indians all throughout the continent. Because they were doing those things. Of course they were. Right? If you were a royal governor or a British Indian agent or a military officer and you could quell this rebellion on the cheap, you'd be a hero. So a good number of British officials are actually doing these things. Of course they are. This, is, this is not, should not be all that surprising. Uh, and FYI, the Patriots are doing that too. Right? They're not talking about it very much, but they are also sending their own agents to try to figure out what role Native peoples might play. And they're trying to figure out uh, 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 sort of how to triangulate a lot of things. In, as soon as the shooting starts, too. They're just not talking about it or promoting that stuff very much. So, and this is kind of happening all over the place. And I talk about in the book, I talk about how this really gives patriots a golden opportunity to denigrate their enemies. 
That's impossible task number two. If impossible task number one is to stay together, impossible task number two is to turn your cultural cousins, your inspiration in all things, culture, politics, economics, social relations, the thing that you, the people that you look to as, as the way things are supposed to be done, the, the height of civility, being an English gentleman, for, for example, how do you turn them into your mortal enemies? Well, here's how I think you can uh, accomplish both tasks. Broadcast the British as evil destroyers of colonial families through, the, through their plotting uh, with slaves and Indians. This is the darkest of colonial nightmares for two centuries. Embracing colonial fears and prejudices accomplishes both impossible tasks uh, simultaneously. And I think the newspapers are the way to carry those images. The exchanges can substantiate those images and that argument. How you get to, how you, the readers, the public, should be terrified of British attempts to get natives or enslaved peoples to kill your family. And who put those stories there? Often it was people uh, who were highly invested in the Patriot movement. Oh, sorry. I thought it was over here. Thank you. Okay, all right. We'll drive. People highly invested in the Patriot movement. So let me give you two examples from 1775 uh, that I think would have resounding effects throughout the war. So in the summer and fall of 1775, news began to appear, and I say that in, a, in the passive voice, but I, I don't mean it that way, uh, about enslaved and free African Americans helping the British. More than we think, by the way. One of the things that I found out, too, is we always sort of telescope that down to uh, Lord Dunmore, who I'm going to talk about here in a minute. But actually, there's a lot more going on than that that almost all the southern governors are accused of. of and, and, and the thing that actually gets like the governor of North Carolina uh, ejected from the colony is rumors of, of that he, is, he and the Royal Navy are working together to, to um, arm slaves. Not exactly all that well told. But the central figure in this construction is Lord Dunmore and his battles with Virginia uh, militia in the fall of 1775 and then the winter and then the spring of the next year. He's, uh, and especially, of course, his November 7th, 1775 proclamation uh, that uh, uh, frees all, all the able-bodied male slaves of Patriot masters uh, that can reach his lines. Right? Uh, nearly half of American papers printed the Dunmore proclamation in full. Um, but it is difficult to underestimate the fascination that American printers displayed for events in the Chesapeake. Many of these stories are known, like Dunmore's proclamation, and then, of course, that uh, the, uh, the men who respond to that appeal, uh, who are wearing uh, 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 uniforms that have liberty to slaves emblazoned on their, on their uh, the tunics of their uniform, those stories are well known. But one I want to tell you about is one that's far less, uh, it's, it's, it's mundane, it's a nothing story but it was reprinted all over the place. All right. It's about a guy named Narsworthy. Mr. Narsworthy, it's all, I don't know what his first name is, Mr. Narsworthy owned a plantation on the James River, and in January of 1776, a foraging party from Dunmore's forces uh, raids the estate, basically looking for livestock. It's a nothing burger story, right? It's nothing. There's nothing really unusual about that. Uh, but. It's an interesting one, right? So this is, the, this is the entire story that's in all these newspapers, right? Six white men, four Negroes, lad, landed, last week landed mist, near to Mr. Narsworthy's in the Isle of Wight County in order to carry off some sheep which they knew were on the plantation. A Negro man who happened to be in the yard, discovering a Negro man dressed in the uniform of the 14th Regiment, immediately went and informed his master that some of the governor's men were landed. He dispatched a Negro to a guard who were then stationed at small distance. They pursued them, took the Negro in uniform, and uh, drove others into their boat without any stock. Uh, because we can't name anybody's name here, we just refer to them as their kind of their, their skin color. It gets kind of confusing, right? Uh, it's a livestock raid. Not great for Narsworthy, uh, but in the scheme of things, not super big news that then was printed in New Haven, Norwich, Providence, New York, Philadelphia, Charleston, Hartford, and Baltimore. This story, right? 14 papers, almost half of colonial newspapers, decided to clip this story and run it in their own columns. That struck me as odd. Why? Well, uh, maybe it uh, could have been reprinted to show the continued loyalty of Virginia slaves. It is Narsworthy's slave that ends up saving the day. 
Uh, but more importantly are the sheer references to black people. After the second word, six white men, uh, uh, black people almost disappear entirely. And blacks are left to battle out the future safety of Mr. Narsworthy and his sheep. Uh, worse, uh, the attackers are gov the governor's men, including uh, blacks in uniform. I actually don't think this is a trivial story. I actually think, to be really sort of a groany about it, this story is newsworthy. This Narsworthy thing is newsworthy. It's a very bad pun. Uh, sorry, there we go. A good groan would be good. Okay, I deserve that. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, example two. In the last few days of 1775, the Continental Congress received a horrifying and yet strangely reassuring letter from Philip Schuyler on the New York frontier, uh, 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 recounting a meeting he had just had with a group of Indians. So the letter says uh, this, right, from Philip Schuyler. The Indians delivered us a speech on the 12th, uh, uh, which they related the substance of all the conferences they had with Colonel Guy Johnson uh, with them last summer, who's the, who's the British superintendent for Indian Affairs where he delivered to each of the Canadian tribes a war belt and a hatchet, after which they were invited to feast on a Bostonian and drink his blood. But all, all, always printed in caps, by the way. All caps, right? So we know this is a lot of shouting going on here, too, right? Now, Schuyler wrote to Congress, we have full proof that the ministerial servants have attempted to engage the savages against us. Congress was so impressed with this sensational letter from the Canadian frontier that they ordered American printers to insert it into their papers to, quote, perpetuate the humanity of the ministers of George III and their agents. The Pennsylvania Post did so first following orders on the 26th of December, and then 16 other printers also followed up in New York City, Annapolis, Boston, Providence, Williamsburg, and Norwich, Connecticut. All those, by the way, ran the cannibalistic story uh, on the very same days that Paine first brought out common sense in Philadelphia. Now, both of these stories have an internal tension. Both of them have good African Americans and Indians helping out the Americans, right? Friendly Indians are informing Schuyler of the offer. They're the ones letting you know this is what's going on. They, they're, and Narsworthy's slave is, is who alerts him of the raid. But I don't think that's the real reason for this kind of coverage. There's also stuff going on here, too. Uh, several of these papers uh, ran at the very same time, and sometimes on the very same page, uh, an, an essay written anonymously by an author who just refers to himself as an American. Okay. How sunk is Britain? Could not Britons venture to wage war with America until they were told Americans were cowards? nor even then without the assistance of Roman Catholics and Indians, uh, while endeavoring to raise amongst us a domestic enemy? Why make use of every base and inhuman stratagem and wage a savage war unknown amongst civilized nations? Who, surely, whoever has heard of Carlton's and Connolly's and Dunmore's plots against us cannot but allow that they must have been authorized by a higher power, I think that means the king and not God, uh, <laughs> most freely would I cut the Gordian knot. This is January 1776. Uh, what we usually narrate is that's the time that Paine changed everybody's mind about declaring independence. Right? But this is also a discourse that's going on in the newspapers that, 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 that Paine is, doesn't, he talks about it a little bit in common sense, but he kind of leaves that to the side. But I think this is also uh, an important thing that's shaping political will toward independence. These sort of snapshots are, are how I think the common cause argument changes after the war began. It's a process, uh, it's a process that uh, and deeply involves a lot of the same men who would also write about natural rights and men being created equal. I argue that this is a darker valence of the common cause argument. And, and, and yet at the same time is a foundational narrative at the construction and the creation of the United States. Fear and prejudice is how they explain the revolution in these kinds of letters, in these kinds of publicity, but also in things like official proclamations. If you go and look uh, deep into the explanations of a lot of the ways they justify, the Congress especially justifies the revolution in the Declaration of the Causes of Necessity taking up arms, but every time they want to explain what goes on to the people of Ireland or Jamaica 
or Canada, oftentimes they will use these arguments about, you know, the real reason we're really upset is because of how the king and his agents are using, are using these kind of proxies against us. And, of course, it's at the heart of the Declaration of Independence. It's the final grievance. The deal breaker uh, about, is about the kings employing slaves and Indians. Uh, all right. Here we go. For the most part, I think we've been reading the Declaration of Independence kind of incompletely. Um, and oftentimes, um, I often uh, uh, show my students, my undergrads especially, this, and then I say, yeah, this is, this is a, a crazy way to re read the Declaration of Independence because it's really bad. Actually, it's a much better student essay than that uh, because this is the way it's supposed to be read with a two-paragraph opening introduction and a body of reasons why what comes first Come, uh, uh, the grievances, and then a two-paragraph conclusion, an intro body and the conclusion. Hey, Jefferson's a good student, right? He's probably a good essay, <laughs> right? So, uh, so if you look, when we focus on the opening two paragraphs, the intro, we're not getting the whole story. There, of course, is where the bundle of ideas about universal human rights and the right to revolution, the consent of the governed stuff happen. And while we've wrestled over what all and men and created and equal means, sort of books written on all four of those words, or pursuit of happiness, we haven't paid attention enough to the bottom, the body. And especially those ones at the end. Uh, as the American Revolution transforms into the Revolutionary War. And I keep think here is the climax of the Declaration. This is the last one. The rub. Jefferson assembled the 27 charges leveled at King George quite carefully. Many of the first dozen charges were, in and of themselves, hardly inspiring enough to encourage farmers to rush to their muskets. You know, if you read them, like the fourth one is about how the king has fatigued us into moving his archives and records from Boston to Cambridge. Like, really? I'm not going to stop a bullet for that, right? Like, <laughs> take the tea over to Cambridge. It's not that big a deal, right? But, you know. But the second, the, the second dozen focuses on a menu of uh, ty uh, tyrannical acts by the uh, parliament and the king's willingness to enforce them. But the real drama is down the page. Uh, the delegates understood this better than we do. Where did they spend their time tinkering with the Declaration? The first 24 go almost in exactly from Jefferson's rough draft straight into the Declaration. They don't mess with that stuff at all in their, in their editing sessions on the 2nd and 3rd of, of July. Uh, they have a few touches here and there, but the first two does, the first 20 or so are intact. But then, where do they spend their time? On this part right here. This is where they added evocative phrases, they deepen the king's crimes here, and they really cut into Jefferson's draft there in this section. Plot because, I think, the Declaration then pivots from the revolution, the American Revolution, this, this, this bundle of ideas uh, about um, natural rights, and into this a little bit darker revolutionary war. From what John Adams wanted us to focus on, to what he denied was even worth our time. So, uh, the final one, of course, is he has excited, excited domestic insurrectionists amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontier, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. So here at the climax, a panoply of enemies stands against the free and independent state. The king here has enthusiastic assistance, rebellious slaves and hostile Indians. And that, that language almost sounds exactly like an American. I don't know who wrote in America. I don't think, I mean, it wasn't Jefferson because we would know, but it's, it could have been one of his pals. I'm not entirely sure, but uh, from Virginia, because it does appear in Virginia thing first. So it could have been John Page or something like that. But that sounds strikingly like six months old essays that were, were bottling around. I'll give you a, another example. In 1779, Benjamin Franklin began work on what would seem an odd assignment for the United States ambassador to France. Congress ordered him to find an engraver in Paris to create three dozen illustrations for a child's school book. Enlisting the help of Marquis de Lafayette, who was there back in France getting, trying to get some sort of guns and ships or some other, other rap song, uh, 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 he, just, uh, he was back in, in, in Paris. Um, that's a Hamilton reference. You didn't laugh like I thought you were. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, Franklin began working on, on this to develop a literal illustration of British cruelties uh, since Lexington and Concord. 
Uh, as he would later explain to a British official, Congress had tasked Franklin to create a book, quote, to impress the minds of children and posterity with a deep sense of your bloody and insatiable malice and wickedness. Congress had asked Franklin to assemble an official catalog of America's suffering. He was to become the revolution's John Fox to arrange the creation of a book of martyrs for the new republic, reminding uh, future generations of Americans just how evil the British truly were. Now, had it materialized, and it didn't, this illustrated school book of Franklin and Lafayette would have been a unique contribution to American education. <laughs> Unlike any other children's school book at the time, it combined political messages with other elements of uh, genres, romantic daring do on the part of, part of heroic patriots, moralizing fables complete with monsters, and clear advice on how children should remember America's enemies as they grow up. In the Franklin Papers is found 26 precise and lengthy descriptions of the proposed illustrations, right? Just one short of how many uh, grievances Jefferson uh, included in the Declaration of Independence. This is a working précis, right? It, it details exactly what they wanted a French engraver to depict. The first 18 are in Franklin's hand, Lafayette added six of his own, and then Franklin came up uh, with the final two. They left very little for the artist's imagination. Franklin's list started with fire. The first illustrations were supposed to depict the towns of Charleston, Charlestown, Massachusetts, Falmouth, and Norfolk, and other American towns ablaze and the inhabitants exposed. Then, after a couple about the mistreatment of prisoners, Franklin began a run of prints that centered on all the people that the British used to help them destroy American liberty, uh, focusing on the king's proxies. So this is what Franklin instructed the engraver to create. Right? So here's, here's 10, 11, 12. And I'll show you 13, 14, 18, and 19 as well. So, all right, so number 10, Dunmore's hiring the Negroes to murder their master's families. So what do I want you to do? Large house, blacks armed with guns and hangers, master and his sons on the ground dead, wife and daughters lifted up in the arms of Negroes are carrying them off. Right, make me a picture. Number 11, savages killing and scalping the frontier farmers and their families, women and children, English officers mixed with savages giving them orders and encouraging them. Number 12, Governor Tonnen of East Florida sitting in, this, in state, a table before him, his soldiers and savages bringing scalps of the Georgia people and presenting to them money on the table for which he pays them. Nice. <laughs> 13, the commanding general at Niagara receiving an alike man of the scalps of the Wyoming families. This is from, uh, this is a lot of uh, misinformation about what happens at, at Wyoming in 1777. Number 14, the king of England giving audience to his secretary of war who presents him with a schedule entitled Account of Scalps, which he receives very graciously. <laughs> Franklin's going to double down on this one and, and create a whole hoax about that whole story, which he makes up out of whole cloth in about three years. Number 18, prisoners killed and roasted for a great festival where the Indi Canadian Indians are eating American flesh, Bostonian or not Bostonian, doesn't say. Colonel Butler and English officers setting a table. All right, there's that story that comes right back again. Feast on a Bostonian and drink his blood. 19, British officers being prisoners on parole are well received in the best American families and take the opportunity of corrupting Negroes and encouraging them to desert from their house to rob and even to murder their masters. Right? This is what he wanted them to do. I mean, um, uh, the list of prints is a fan fascinating document that I think encapsulates the patriot efforts over the first few years of the revolution to mobilize the population for battle. Most of it happened, it comes from stories from when Franklin was still in the, in the United States, 75, 6, 7, right? And, and he, he thinks, and Franklin, of all people, is, is really, really upset. I mean, when you see Franklin, He's foaming at the mouth about a lot of the stuff he refers to. Uh, he cannot believe that the British have done this, which of course they have. Um, you know, uh, a lot of my, some of my very favorite Franklin things about, you know, uh, would you believe it? It's like, it's like paying off an Italian Bravo to murder you in your bed, right? Like this crazy, it's like, Franklin, calm down, man. Uh, 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 this is not what's going on, right? <laughs> Dude. Uh, so, uh, but all, most of these proposed illustrations of, revolve on three topics. Canadian, Canadian, Canadian of towns, 
British mistreatment of prisoners, or blacks and Indians destroying American households and familial bliss. And Congress wanted Americans to remember these crimes. And these were specific images that Franklin and Lafayette decided best capture the revolutionary experience thus far. For, uh, Lafayette opined to his partner that they could indeed make out an immense book upon so rich a matter as British cruelties. Uh, but these are the particular ones that they thought deserved exploration. Now, ultimately, this was for naught. Uh, which, which Franklin was very frustrated by, because he had high hopes for this book. High hopes. He told a correspondent uh, that he envisioned these illustrations, quote, expressing every abominable circumstance of British cruelty and inhumanity to adorn the first coinage of the United States. He thought, this is what Congress is actually paying for. Not just a child's school book, but we're going to use these images and put them on our money. Franklin's school book and Lafayette's school book, complete with lavish and shocking illustrations, never managed to make it into America's classrooms, nor did the images find their way into American purses and pockets. Nevertheless, Franklin and Lafayette meant to transform war stories about African American and Indians cooperating with the British in the newspapers, this kind of ephemeral stuff that just goes out, into much more indelible pictures that would instruct future generations about who tried to destroy liberty at the founding. The Declaration and this school book, I think, are really good ways to capture this dark side of the common cause. It gained power uh, through the exchange newspaper stories starting as soon as the shooting started. And it went week after week after week. And it really is a kind of a shocking amount of material. This long book was longer. I cut, I, yeah. No way. Yes, I cut 400 pages out before it is what you have. <laughs> Partly because, I mean, here's the reason why it's so long, is because I didn't want someone to say, yeah, 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 yeah. I had all this material, I mean, all this stuff. I couldn't believe how much I found. And so I figured I needed to give it, a, I needed to make it a brick. Boom, deal with this, yeah. right? Deal with this, like, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> what this? Uh, here's your radical revolution, right? So how do you, how do you I mean, otherwise it's like, yeah, if it, if it was 200 pages long, but yeah, 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 that stuff's there. Yeah, but it's also in, in, with this stuff. It's a lot. Um, and I think this dark side of this common cause appeal has policy implications, too. It's not just that this is going on in the revolution. Because I think it informs how those leaders who craft the first state constitutions and the Articles of Confederation uh, did what they did. I think it undercut a movement for abolition. Hard to measure, but I think it did undercut it. It dissolved a movement to incorporate or treat fairly native peoples. And here's where it really matters. Because of course this kind of racial animus had happened before. That's why I think it was as powerful as it was in 1775. War always brings out the worst in people, and in American history that usually means racial prejudice and violence. And a lot of books before mine claimed all sorts of origin stories for American racism some of them won the Bancroft Prize, uh, going back to the earliest years of settlement, King Philip's War, 1741 Slave Rebellion, Seven Years' War, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this might sound like special pleading, but I think that the Revolutionary War was different because, unlike those conflicts, this one created the United States. And not only that, but because those same leaders decided to create the United States in the particular way they did, as a republic based on citizenship, which they didn't really understand, as opposed to a monarchy with subjects, these stories mattered a great deal. Citizenship is a club. Uh, the members decide who's in and who's out. And because uh, these stories, I think, became foundational, they're very much a, a competing discourse, a, a, a dialectic that also develops uh, after 1775. I think this matters uh, a whole lot after Yorktown. I think it undercut a real movement for equality or for the universality that's in the first lines of the Declaration. In many ways, the African uh, Americans or Native peoples were beside the point. It's not really about them. Right? It's more about what the British are doing to them. The evil ones in my stories aren't really Natives or enslaved peoples at all. It's Dunmore and Carleton and Johnson, the King's men. 
But that construction that, of using natives and blacks as proxies to get at the real enemy had a lasting effect. Nearly all of the men at the heart of my story, either publicly or privately, disliked slavery and wished it away. Jefferson, Adams, Hamilton, Washington, Patrick Henry, Sam Adams, John Lawrence, Henry Lawrence, Benjamin Rush, on and on. John's Columbia County, uh, uh, Ashbel Stoddard, printer, published a bunch of sla anti-slavery stuff in the 1780s. But some of those items, while he was an apprentice at the, uh, the, uh, the Connecticut Courant, was publishing these kinds of stories as well. I think that has, has an effect. Uh, but because they were instrumental in putting before the public the notion that all black people are helping the king. That they're in league with the tyrant. There's not any kind of nuance with these things. There's not any kind of shading between, oh, we don't, what do I mean all savages are merciless? It, all, it just says that, right? Just says as they all are. Um, they disqualify themselves. Uh, the other half of my argument, by the way, one of the reasons the book is as long as it is, is because I try to talk about how those Indians and African Americans, the 5,000 African Americans that serve in the Continental Army, you won't find them in the papers at all. Very scant traces of that. Very scant traces of, of, of the Stockbridge or the Oneida or the Tuscarora or the Onondaga that held them. Very slim. They're there, but there's a compared to the amount of ink spilled on the other side, they just almost disappeared. You basically had to see the Continental Army march by or serve with it uh, to see how many non-white faces are in the ranks serving with Washington. Because you wouldn't know that from reading the paper, that's for sure. So I think this is why Adams wanted to say the war didn't matter, right? I love this, this one, because well, Adams is side-eyeing us here. I love this one. Like, he's just going to be giving us a side-eye. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> I think he's not telling the whole truth here, right? What do we mean by the revolution? The war, that's no part of it, right? Uh, the revolution is in the hearts and the, mi the minds of the people. And he does say future historians should search the records of the 13 legislatures, the pamphlets, the newspaper, and all the colonies. I did that. I just did that after he wanted me to. And what I found there was not exactly what Adams wanted me to find. Uh, because I think he and his friends are implicated in a much darker and much less inclusive revolution and the United States. If you focus on the common cause appeal after 1775, that's, that's, uh, it still is about, there are still people arguing for human universal rights. That doesn't really go away. But there's this other competing thing that happens at that time that is driven by fear and prejudice. Their work, which they wanted to go away, I think, lived on, and I think it trapped them too. Because that would become foundational. The, these stories would live on for decades and decades. And that exclusionary impulse that underpins them, that underpins this, that some people belong to the Republic and some people really don't, I think that's there at the founding and I, I still think it's there. And that's Take your own questions. Okay, I'll give you that. Yes? Um, I suspect it's because you didn't have time, but you talk about in your book the others who are others and equally demonized. Yeah. I mean, this, this summary has a racial demonization. Uh, one of your slides referred to the Catholics, of course, from Quebec. Right. And the others are the Hessians and other German mercenaries right. who are equally merciless and brutal in their um, abusing of Americans in every possible way, at least according to this right. narrative. And, uh, and what the story there is equally as complicated because it was not all Germans and in Pennsylvania in 1775 there were a group of German migrants who volunteered to organize and equip a company of hussars in the Prussian mm -hmm. uh, equipage uh, initially approved by the Continental Congress and then a week or so later declined without any yeah. explanatory as to why that was declined. Uh, 
there may be a question here. I'll just I'll just mention these things and, and right. you can comment. And then the, the follow up is uh, so really in now the movement to have a Muslim ban and to build a huge beautiful wall to keep out immigrants. Yeah. If your story of the founding is correct, that really is making America great again. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Uh, I don't like that so much. But, um, right. Okay, about, about the Germans, too. Because the, the German mercenaries are the thing I didn't talk about, which is a, a plays a role, in, a, a important role in the book. Right? So, I didn't leave them out of Franklin's school book. They're not there. Right? There's no mention of a German mercenary in Franklin's school book. So what happens is, when, uh, uh, the first thing is that they, um, the, the, the king approaches Catherine the Great, actually, first, and says, can I get some Russians to come over? And she says no, and so that's why they kind of begrudgingly uh, uh, turn to the German states to, to get these things. And, and there's a huge fight that happens in Parliament about that because we're basically paying for Germans to immigrate to the United States, uh, is what they think. They're all going to desert as soon as they get there. And there's this lot of sort of gnashing of teeth about what, what role these German mercenaries are going to play. And there's a lot, they refer to them as the men monsters and all kinds of terrible stuff. They're going to, they're going to establish all kinds of horrible things here, and they're going to become um, lords and will become their serfs and all horrible stuff. And then Trenton happens, and, and they disappear entirely. That was one of the things that I was so surprised about. When you see Hessians after Trenton, they are, first of all, congratulations, because it's really hard to find them. Second of all, they're always deserting away from the, the crown and coming towards us. Or they are incredibly disgruntled, um, and really, or they are fellow victims of monarchical tyranny. Right, and and there's a lot of sort of as soon as the war after Yorktown in 1782 and three, there's a lot of um, uh, of ways of. I mean, there's there's, a, there's a one guy there's one guy who actually writes to Congress in 1781 and says, "Hey, I hear you're moving the prisoners of war, these Hessian prisoners of war, away from Massachusetts. I can't lose my guy. He's the one operating my powder mill. <laughs> so he's making gunpowder for the Continental Army, and I, he's desperately needed. So the, the Hessians almost immediately get." redeemed. And that kind of opportunity, and in the same way with the French Catholics, right? Like, this, I, the, those two examples to me explain what's the potential for redemption here. That I think all bets are off. If you were to explain to anybody in Massachusetts that you're going to celebrate the Dauphin, birth of the Dauphin in 1782, really? <laughs> um, like, if, if, you, if you can reconsider anti-popery, why can't you reconsider how you think about Native Americans, or, or at least cons or try to be more nuanced about it? I mean, there's, you know, the, the Delaware are offered statehood in a treaty conference in 1778, the, 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 and that just drops completely. That dies, um, and so I think there are potentials here for renegotiation and rethinking things. And the fact that it turns out the way it does isn't necessarily how we should think about it. As it goes through, and so the, so those are my two counterexamples: are the Hessians, uh, they are redeemed, and and the French Catholics who are redeemed with open arms, and we love these guys, right? Uh, uh, this could have been the other way for, for uh, other peoples, but it wasn't. Uh, why not? Yeah. Well, I am uh, Nolan Madalena. I, I teach at Red State University. Well, thank you for coming. And um, I signed this book. Oh, uh, did you? I saw a review of it and I said, I'll order this book for my grad class, you know, and then the first had arrived. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we split it into two weeks. So, um, in my way, I do the 17th century more than the revolution. I okay. teach the revolution. And so my, I, it's an amazing piece of work. Thank you. Um, what? <laughs> just, just the idea that, um, any, you know, that, that this is a new development of the war. This is only a little bit, I would, you know, no right. one's a paper yet. Um, that, you know, what about the Paxton boys? And yes. What about the proclamation line? Right. That, you know, the way I teach this same thing, I've always talked about the Declaration of Independence exactly the way. I teach it as a speech, mm. right? Because mm. it has to be read. Right. And it's building. Right. And yeah. that's the big fit. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's the number one yeah. grievance. It's not yes. the last grievance. It's the number one because we're building to their treachery and their cruelty and their, right? From yes. the boring Good. stuff, right? Yeah. But. The deal breaker. I also. <laughs> You know, talk about from 63 or 64, 63 yeah. really, um, from Pontiac on, that 
if you look at the revolution from the American Indian side, even the revolution that he's talking about in 1760, I always go, liberty, liberty, it's about my land, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And every action that the American state takes, you know, because they're in Ohio in the 1790s, trying to beat Little Turtle and losing, but, right, and building right. an army. And right. so, it, to me, it's the portrayal of Indians as savages and our big common enemy right. is not new in the war. Mm -hmm. At all. No, it's I don't think it's a longer is. thing. Sure. And, and um, right, and that's but that's why it has the valence that it has, right? Because the, you can yeah. tap into all these things. Oh, right. right. That, and that's why, and because you can also. This is where the it's it's not fake news, right? It's not fake news, no, it's right? Not it's fake there's news. there's a kernel of truth here, right? right? So the fact that they that's why I think it has the import that it has. I, what I'm saying of what's different about it is this the the politis, the politicization of it saying that word wrong, the politicization of it, is important, right? It's, it's, that kind of fear is drafted for, for political and constitutional means in, in a different way. And it didn't have to be, right? But it's, it's See, right I there. It didn't have to be because you are coming after that land, on, on, right? Yeah. You're coming after that land, whether you, you, you're going to portray them as savages, but it's not the end of it. Yeah. You were always coming, it was always about Ohio. Maybe, yes or no, but Daniel Boone is not a hero before the revolution. Correct. Right? The revolution, if you read, I mean, John Filson, that, Daniel Boone is made a hero because he takes this heroic stand against, against British and their Indian allies, mm -hmm. right? So, so and if you look at, this is stuff I'm working on now, is this, these kind of, the frontier folk in the 1760s and 70s are not celebrated as quintessential American heroes before the revolution. The revolution makes them that. So I, so whether, I think out in Ohio it is about land, but is it, is it all about that in Williamsburg and Philadelphia? I don't know. Yeah, yeah they, you know, they had the Ohio Company of Virginia. They just got ripped off by the king who, who picked the Indians above them. Right, but, I mean, that is but right, the big right, problem... There's alliance from these assholes. Right, right. But, what, right? but it's um, the assholes that, that yeah. undermine the whole project, right? So we don't like these guys so much, right? We want to make a lot of money from them, but those are the guys that are causing all the problems, right? They act like it, they're horrible people, right? The frontier settlers who are out there. As far if, if you were, if you were in the power centers on the eastern coast, right. you find those people to be a huge problem until you absolutely need them, and then uh oh, and, you, and they, they and that's the other thing that gets inverted too is now Daniel now we love us some Daniel Boone right, right. Now, Jefferson doesn't like that guy beforehand but he certainly <laughs> does after so I think I think that that um, uh, yes it's this law it's this what this it's the colonial nightmare right it's always been there. And now we get to, and because it happens at this moment of, of uh, republic state making, republican state making, that that, that adds to the, the importance of it. It's not just an ephemeral thing that goes away like you see in the 17th and 18th century, uh, um, where it, it kind of crests and builds and crests and builds, or uh, crests and goes away, right? Mm -hmm. I will agree with that, um, the propagandizing yeah. of yeah. it, yeah. and for sure, you know, it's not, they're not creating this. Yeah. And it does create, and this is what I loved about your book, a com it reminds people from Maine to Florida. Yes. We all hate Indians. Yes. Well, you hated Indians, I hated Indians. I didn't realize that, you did, that we had that in common. Exactly. You hated the British. Exactly. And now it looks who else we hate. And yes. I think that's, I, I think that was the crucial argument. Right. Where, you know, and you know what we don't talk about? We don't talk about things that divide us. Like, like this is what I always say about, like, I always ask my students, like, raise your hand if you hate the Yankees, right? And everybody's hand goes up, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Hate the Yankees. All right, now whose baseball team are you for? Oh, then it becomes five or six different answers, and everybody kind of goes, you like the Cubs? I hate the Cubs, right? It's the Cardinals. So this is the thing, right? This is, that's what they do in 1775. Who hates Indians? Woohoo! Right? Now, let's not talk about, like, didn't you hang Quakers in New mm -hmm, England? Mm -hmm, like, right, right, right. I'm a Quaker. and mm. So that's the kind of stuff that they don't want to talk about. Oh, um, or land, which can also be divisive. So, um, so I think that's where this, 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 but I think why it's important is, what, uh, of course, that's, that's why people are, are getting executed in New York in 1741 kind of crazily, because they're, they're terrified of, yeah. of rebellious Indians, or um, uh, rebellious uh, slaves coming from all over the Atlantic. But, but now you're also making these unclear decisions about citizenship, and that's where I think this begins to have legs, because these stories are, are going to continue.
I, I guess, yeah, that's what I was sort of saying. The one thing I would say was different is I'd say Indians had never, ever, ever had a chance of being citizens. We were coming for that land and they were going to hold it because I'm to come stand and not giving it up. Are you kidding me? So it was going to be war no matter what. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There was never a chance. There might have been a chance for um, abolition and, right? Uh, Three blacks could have become citizens, but there was never. I, I, that's, that's, a, a, that's an, there's an imagination there that I don't think we have because we know what happens. I mean, the, the Articles Confederation makes specific, concrete language about what Congress can do about negotiating with Indians. As, a, as you know, as one of my colleagues at UVA was Leonard Sadowski, wrote this really great book um, uh, called Re Re Revolutionary Negotiations. And it's about how that is a road that closes, where it was there, about thinking about Indians just like you think about negotiating with Paris or, or London. You think about negotiating with Indians in the same way, and that's a road that closes, where now, now they are not to be negotiated with in that kind of way. And that's a, 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 a uh, instead of being a peer-to-peer -peer negotiation, that slips down. And I just wonder if, if if the kind of nuance that we see with the Germans or the French Catholics, if that would have been the case, if, if Jefferson would never never put that kind of language in there about merciless Indian savages, and you see a lot of people negotiating uh, um, in the Ohio frontier with and not killing Cornstalk and um, and uh, Captain Pipe and some of these guys, if you're actually talking to them in ways and respecting their uh, their wishes, which is about land, then I don't know what how it, how that goes down. But that doesn't happen, and they and they kill him, right? But like Cornstalk is one of the most important American allies, and not only do they kill him, and not only do they never investigate who kills them, right? But that murder, which is big news, disappears. Like you never, you very, you don't see any mention of that, which is a huge loss, right? This is this really important uh, person at an incredibly important time, an incredibly important place, and you'd think that would be huge news. Thinking of your book is um, one. Thanks for this great talk. Thank you. Uh, thanks for this great book. Um, I keep thinking of it as, as the <clears throat> first chapter of Alexander Saxton's Rise of the Roman mm. Republic, uh, effectively taking the backside. Of, you know, you were focusing earlier. I'm going to focus later. Um, that this is this is a memory story, in effect. Yeah. That um, uh, that we infuse this racial animosity yeah. in the. Um, it becomes part of this. It, 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 the stories that are there before become fused with national identity, mm -hmm. and then it, it persists through the um, you know, century. I mean, one, one, you know, one problem there is that that's a much more democratic, capital D democratic inflected rhetoric yeah. than a Whig or Whig um, yeah. rhetoric or an abolitionist rhetoric. And there are yeah. there are abolitionists eventually. And Oh sure, and they, they have an alternative story, and they're actually deeply hostile to stuff. Uh, Absolutely, right? But that's why I think there's a, it's, it's double faced, right? right yeah. So instead of instead of we, what I was saying is we need to think about how this kind of dialectic emerges instead of it just being one way of thinking. Yeah, about right. it. yeah, yeah. Because of course it, it gives tremendous um, lift mm -hmm. to be able to for abolitionists to talk about this uh, for their origin story too. Well, let me let me play with you, okay? Because uh, all right. Um, you suggested a few minutes ago that, that I, I, this is a methodological thing, I guess. Um, you uh, see yourself as an old school guy, go and look at the original stuff, which I, I believe in that. But I also believe in testing <laughs> things against the testing things against the against the inference. I mean, in other words, that we can go and do things in, in the databases right. uh, that are not. You know, I can't find everything, but I can find patterns. And so I wondered if you know, is there any way that you could see doing this that would Situate, you know, you mentioned this is the dark side of the discourse. Yeah. So how do we how do we weigh the discourse? How do we weigh the elements of the discourse? Is this the is this like right seventy percent? Is this twenty five percent? And where does this sit in a in a map of the discourse of the period? That's a that's a good question. I mean, what 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 I meant by being an old school guy about this was what I would not have picked up on had I done word searches mm -hmm. is. Not not just, and it's about kind of about that. It's not just um, um, that these things appear. It's 
how they appear and it, in, in what kind of context, like uh, how they appear sometimes on the same page, yeah, right. right? And how, how you know, you'll see like the declaration of the causes and necessity of taking up arms on the front page. The end of that says, uh, at the end of it is like breaking news, we, like the last thing they talk about is like, oh, and, and this stuff's happening in the Canadian frontier, right? For a lot of those newspapers, uh, that's on the front page, when you turn the page, then there's the actual evidence of this. Then they'll say, here are the letters from the Canadian yeah. frontier, right? So you'll see them. Yeah. So now, uh, how much of this is, um, I, I think there's a, uh, it's difficult for me to, to tell you, um, this is about 40% and the 60% is the light side and the dark side, like, um, uh, but I, I was surprised by how much material there was and, and um, in well, addition to, to talking about things like the, the prison shifts as the war goes on, but also um, uh, other statements about liberty and things like that, 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 stuff, that stuff's there. I'm not saying that it's gone. Um, I was surprised about how much of this appeared. Well, I guess what I'm trying to get is you can actually get at the, the wider shape of that discourse. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but like, so I would have, so just, I don't want to preempt any questions, but like this, this, if we go back to my thing here, right? So this is, this is a Declaration of Independence, right? This is, this, that's why I kept this one, right? So this is, this is, a, this is an excerpt of the whole thing, right? Actually, this is, um, this actually in some ways under, uh, cuts out my point entirely because the, the grievances aren't there. So this is the top two uh, and the bottom two. And they publish it later on. They, they, they give, this is just a, sort of an abstract of the whole thing, right? But if you look at this, you also see how some of these other stories yeah. would be here and yeah. give other evidence too. And one of the things that I found really super fascinating was there was this crazy confluence of, of things that I really had to pay attention to. So uh, in, uh, in the summer of 1776, uh, a, a Philadelphia playwright named John Leacock wrote a, wrote a play called The Fall of British Tyranny. And... Um, uh, it's it's published. It, it, it's not perfor it's, it's performed a couple of times, so it's mostly published. So you could read it yourself, and um, and it was a, there were a number of um, uh, uh, scenes in Act Two, I think, mm -hmm. of of Dunmore and his black regiment, and there was this there was this runaway uh, a slave now an officer called Captain Cudjo, uh, who is in this. He's in the, he's not he's I think the the second um, African American to have dialogue in any American play. Um, uh, uh, I think the first one is in 1770, and this is the second one to have actual dialogue. And it's a very, very sort of racist and pigeon dialect this guy has. But he's actually threatening to kill everybody that he sees, and this is why he's a little bit scary. So you have this, this, this uh, and, and you'll see an advertisement on the last page that lists all the scenes. Um, of this play, and one says, you know, a, a very black scene between Captain Cudjo and Lord Dunmore, or no, he's referred to as Lord Kidnapper, or between Lord Kidnapper and Captain Cudjo. There's a couple of different mentions of this, right? So that's a, that's a it's a literary advertisement for a for a pub, someone who's publishing a play. The one column over, it's a list of all the people who are captured at Long Island, which is supposed to be real life, and one of them is Captain Cudjo. Which I, there's no such person as that, right? It's almost like, you know, you get in the newspaper and the next day it says, Jay Gatsby dies in a car crash, right? <laughs> what? That's not a real person, right? So, uh, but there's this weird sort of, and, and that also is published alongside each other in several newspapers like that. So this is kind of really weird blending of fact and fiction, right? Um, there's no such person as that, but he had, serves as this kind of totem. Um, and that's only something I would have done had I actually read the whole thing um, and not kind of dipped in, but. And, Kudge, and, and Captain Kudjo, by the way, is a very, it goes a long way back. I mean, there's a, go back to the 1740s, um, um, and he's a J uh, Jamaican maroon um, uh, uh, who has a, there's a treaty with him. That, that, there's more to that story, too. I'm filibustering. Somebody else has a question? Yeah. What does the discourse in these newspapers about uh, slave violence and Indian violence look like before? The, the 1775, or even before 1760, is there a thread that gets picked up and incorporated yeah. during this period? Yeah. What does it look like? Well, oftentimes there's, there's a prime mover. Usually that person is French. Um, and uh, I, I, I do rem uh, remember in, in 1775, uh, right as the war is beginning, 
there is uh, there's this kind of shadowy figure on the Canadian frontier, and it's uh, St. Luke Lacorn, who is the uh, Indian agent at Fort William Henry in 1757. And, and it says there, uh, oh, George, what tools art thou making use of, right? And so there's almost always this kind of uh, shadowy kind of figure, and that's also a really good way to, to create enemies. It's the French and the Catholics and the Indi and Indians. Um, uh, almost as often as not, it's, uh, there are white guys who are seen as even more savage than, than Indians when they talk about Westerners. This is kind of stuff that I'm working on now, is, is, is white guys who are out on the frontier um, who uh, kill and butcher Indians, and they are seen as really despicable people before the revolution for doing these kinds of things, which opens up a different kind of space for how we think about people out on the frontier. That changes dr dramatically. You don't see that kind of thing happening uh, after the revolution. So I, I, uh, so I think it, and that's one of the things that makes it easy, is they just kind of take the French out and put the British right in, right, and, as, as the king or the parliament or all these people. And that, may, and oh, and that, that, that fits this script, right? It fits this kind of script of, of, of how we think about bad guys. But there's, there's always a white puppet master. Almost always, because oh, that's more comfortable, right? If we can get rid of that, then there's not real. There's not really a problem with them, like well, slavery or, yeah. But there's there's this person, or that they're being incredibly irrational and and inherently incessantly violent, right? This is this is part of of, of Indian savage nature, right? Yeah. I wonder if the, if the story is that um, an organization that's fragile needs an outgroup to identify yeah. against, and. I think the story that you told is that it's fairly malleable, sort of who that outgroup is, as long as everyone can agree. And so you see them shifting, as you just said, from the French to the British. Yeah. Why does it have such legs then over time? Is there something underlying that that made that narrative more likely? Like, is this is this not the only sort of reason why we have this sort of persistence? Um. Well, I think that I think founding stories are important. I mean, this is why I say it's kind of flippantly to undergrads all the time. Like, how many? super action heroes are there about the founding, why Superman becomes Superman or Spider-Man becomes Spider-Man. I think that this is, there's like nine of those movies, right? Um, uh, I do think that uh, because these are told at the founding, that they have this kind of resonance that people continue to reach, reach back to and reach, reach for a lot. Um, so the, the, um, the hoax that when Franklin says this stuff about the account of scalps, um, uh, Franklin writes this long hoax uh, about all, talking about all of what all the scalps look like in 1782. It's, it's, it's entirely made up story. It's an invoice of all the bags of scalps um, that Franklin make, writes, uh, and it gets published in the United States uh, and in London and in the United States as fact in 1782. In 1814, a number of newspapers publish it again as fact and says, look how long the British have been doing this with Indians, right? And they reach right back to it. It was all, it was all bullshit then, and it is in 1814, but there's this idea that of, of, of grounding that, that continues to have this kind of, I think, this kind of resonance. Um, it won't always, but there's, I, again, there's this, this uh, and there's also this, it can also be sort of counter stories to that, too, that also have their own grounding and resonance. Uh, but... Um, again, like, I, like there's this this notion of of something there at the founding, something there at the beginning of this that, that becomes, I think, in many ways, part of the cornerstone. Um, uh, when people want to go back and, and talk about it, um, uh, talk about, and when they want to justify anything, uh, why they're right, they go back to the founding, and I think that that's why this is important. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, this um, sorry, I'm Amy Shuster. I'm from the philosophy department. I have to introduce myself because I feel a little out of my, um, my water right now. Okay, you're welcome. Um, could, could you go back to the, or go forward to the, the one about, um, uh, yeah. This one? On the Bostonian. Ooh, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in this idea that you have a more sort of universalistic um, message being circulated in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the interior pages afterwards, um, and I um, and I was interested in this in this, um, but also even in the Newsworthy one, the yeah. Nice one, because um, 
not all Indians are presented as bad. Right, right. Um, but it does seem to me that your thought is that there is a generalization that happens there. Yeah. I wasn't quite certain I was following oh. where you uh, the generalization. Yeah. Um, it, this is is 95 five. Uh, there are uh, uh, every time we, when we talk about Indians, five percent of the time, and almost always it's a surprise, right? Like the Oneida helped us, huh? <laughs> right? And it's, uh, it's almost always it's a surprise. Uh, whenever, whenever, whenever um, you know you have a significant like Sullivan's campaign with the Iroquois, uh, the, he always points out kind of this really surprising exception that the number of Indians actually helped us. Uh, but that, that is, the, the 5%, which is there, are, are surrounded by these, these kind of much more visceral images about, which is, this is all, you know, this is not really about cannibalism. This is, this is you know, it's, 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 it's part of a ceremony. It's about, you know, kind of, it's, it's about sort of ox blood and, and, and other stuff that, that's also old. I mean, we, we, some of the stuff that, anybody who knows anything about how Indian uh, treaties go, this kind of thing isn't all that unusual, uh, but it certainly seems to be so in, in this case. Um, uh, it's actually and, and, and so it's, it's about 95.5. And when it comes to when it comes to African Americans, it's about 98.2. Um, almost always, um, with a, just a handful of exceptions, where you see uh, African Americans helping the cause, which it shouldn't have been, right? It shouldn't have been. That does not reflect reality. Doesn't reflect reality when it comes to Native peoples or African Americans, but how they are portrayed um, in in what people know about mostly about the Revolution. Like I said, unless you served with them, which a lot of people did, right? There's not a small number of American men served, and some women served in the Continental Army. Um, but unless you, or if you were if you were paying attention to what's going on strictly through this vicarious nature of, of print or uh, or, or um, then it would be very difficult to know. So, and there aren't, like, and I also think that that um, is something that, that uh, loses this kind of nuance as we go further on into the Revolutionary War too, right? This is, this is, this war is like six months old at this point. Three or four years in, you very rarely, except with this kind of surprising exception that you see, um, talk of Amer uh, Indians supporting the, the Americans. It becomes this this kind of concept of all are against us, and that's why all should be dispossessed. And conquest theories that happen in in New York and other places in the treaty conferences afterwards. You all served the king. You lost. You get our, we get your land. Ha ha ha. Yeah. Yeah. I can just add to that. Sure. I, mean, I was thinking it was the most profoundly racist thing of all, which is what you were saying earlier. They always have a white agent. Yeah. In other words. Um, both blacks and yeah. Indians are have savage nature, but if they're guided in the right way by a white yes. man, yes. right? So the the slave who tells the previous one, work is the servant, is he not? He's the enslaved person. Yeah. You have to be in the yard. Yeah. Um, so he goes and tells his master. Yeah. He's controlled by me, and he's right. Right. And so I've got his savagery under control. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And what these other white men are doing, which was French, Spanish even mm -hmm. at one point, um, and now British are unleashing. Yes. Yes. They're unleashing this. Yep. But these folks are blank, apparently. Almost always passive verbs. Right. Almost, Almost always. Almost always. I've right. seen that too. Mm -hmm. um, who are just the agents, mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. and, and controlled, mm -hmm. so they can be controlled for good. Yeah. Or unleash. Yes. Especially American Indians unleash. Because slaves are owned, mm -hmm. they might be. Yeah, they they have to be excited, they have to be tampered with. Like all these things are about activation, right? Because the nature is passive, and, right. and, and that I think I think. But was, that, an, uh, but was a uh, savage and, spirit somewhere? Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so you have the you have these stories performing sort of dual functions, right? On one hand, they bring backcountry settlers into the common cause, right? They need something to fight for. They've been fighting Indians for decades. Yeah. And that's what they want. They want the British and the American government to help them yeah. um, and protect them. You also have the stories bringing sort of the settlers in suburban New York off the couch, right? That mm. they're disaffected and, mm. and now, they, now they want, they should buy in, they should put skin in yeah. the game. 
What does this do moving forward to the fact that the artisans in these small towns in New York become citizens because they own property, they own the means of their own production, whereas often the backcountry settlers don't. They're tenants. They don't get citizenship rights in the same way in the state of New York until the 1820s. Mm. They go out to the backcountry in Pennsylvania. They fight a war over whiskey. It's not so much a war as it is a minor insurrection. I wouldn't think those. The people out there would consider themselves anything other than citizens. Okay. But I, I guess my question is, what does this do for that for that tension? Because the backcountry settlers don't gain, in, especially with the Constitution, in the same way that those living in the urban centers in they the don't? East do. Well, uh, oh, I don't. I think if, I think the whiskey farmers. I think you're right about right. that. But I think that they would certainly see themselves as equal members of the body politic. No, that's my question. Right? Is is would they see them? Would they see them? Would the Easterners see them as? Cause yeah. That's, yeah. That's where they don't want in the 1760s. Right? It's the white settlers that are causing all these problems. If right. They could just you know, not dispossess Indian land. Then that, we wouldn't actually have to go out there and. You know, right, see right. Them. Well, I, I, and I do think they, they believe themselves more, more deserving of the blessings of government. And when those blessings don't come, then maybe we sell our stuff, maybe we sell our goods and services to the Spanish, right? Or we break off and, 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 and threaten the Union that way. Right? I mean, that's also sort of what's going on here. But I think that the, I think the revolution, certainly in the minds of people in the backcountry believe that this has now earned them something, earned them equality. No? Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just saying this is not the central point of what you're doing. No. Right. It's yeah. not to worry about the specifics of who's, I mean, we want, but what you draw is a picture of a cultural bubble yeah. in the public space, public yeah. sphere, and that is being managed by, by gatekeepers, and they are putting specific stuff up in the, you know, and they are mm -hmm. copying each other, they, they're almost a block. To, to create an ideological construct, yeah. um, and that's, um, I mean, I, 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 I am tempted to push you on the counting, because what I've done the counting for the rights, uh -huh. charter rights, natural rights, equal rights, it, it dropped off like a rock after 1775. Both equal, equal rights, I expected to surge in 76, it disappears. So I suspect that you did word counts on, you, know, you think it's even more of a story than I'm making out to me? I think I, mean, I think there's a story. All right. Is, is yeah. Your 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 classic yeah. you know inclusive consent stuff is drops like a rock, right. and I suspect that your your Indian savage. Yes. Um, All right. I, I, I didn't want to say that, but yeah. Brief, I mean, I think that, that, you know, really, right. that you could have a table in here that would prove your you know you could have a figure. I think it's should because I create these things. <laughs> right, right. I can see this. I can see this happening here, where you could have, you could show. Okay, well, let's. We're just using the early American inference as a, mm -hmm. as a body of data, yeah. raw data, and we have years, we have months. Yeah. But we don't. Months is hard. Take raw work. Yeah. But I can show you that the rights drops off. That's a fact. And the and references to Indians yeah. suddenly surges, and we know that. I mean, you have demonstrated that every reference to an Indian. Yeah, ninety-five percent of it was negative. Yes, every reference to a to uh, uh, to savagery, savagery. You know, that's uh, that's clear as bell. Yeah, and we can actually see that ebbing, and then the question uh, flowing, and then the question is the ebbing. What happens after seventeen eighty-three? How it happens to this language? Mm -hmm. That's beyond your turf, but right. I'm just suggesting there's more can be done with this because mm -hmm. you 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 created the, the, the mm -hmm. story, but it's still free floating. And it's not been kind of kind of situated. Yeah. And I suspect what you've got then is 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 this or what you have, you've demonstrated that there's this racial discourse that fills the space. Um, uh -huh. and there are other discourses that could be filling it, but they don't have much traction. Right. Uh, well here's what here's what I do know when it comes to that. Um, anti slavery publications are at their highest they've ever been in seventeen seventy four, mm -hmm. and they disappear. Anti-slavery publications. Anti-slavery publications. Yeah, right, right. Anthony Benize never publishes a single thing. Right. He publishes mm -hmm. one thing in 1781. Yeah. It's, it's next thing. Samuel Hopkins is in 1776. That's the only one I know that really takes on anti-slavery right. in full force. Right. Yeah. It's not, though. He publishes after the Revolutionary War on the anti-slave trade. But that's but, because But of it's after the war. That's There's right. this six-year gap right. when nothing happens. Right. Well, so he's being occupied by Newport. But 
I mean, that's yeah. But but but, but if you if you look at it in the aggregate, you know, the question is, you have this bubble, and I want to I want to situate the bubble. I think yeah. I should strengthen your story. In fact, mm -hmm. by doing the stuff that you dissed early on, if you're playing <laughs> with the with the uh, your inference, the inference. If you try to quantify, I'm actually right. working with them to try to get them to allow us to do to do database searches yeah. much more easily to situate this dense stories right. that you've got. Okay, so where do they sit? And what are their competing stories? Well, this is, and Jefferson refers to that slavery as the great object of desire at the very end of 1774. He says this is something that everybody, everybody wants. And he really means a slave trade, but he re, he's talking about everybody, it's, all, it's basically on everybody's lips and then it just absolutely dies. Mm -hmm. uh, the first meeting of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society is in March of 1775. They don't meet again until 1781, yeah. right? Well, well, something happens in those six years. Something really important happens in those six years. Yeah. We, we but always... then again, to counter that, if these words are and this discourse is so everything, um, why does half the country end slavery fairly immediately after um, the revolution? Right, Massachusetts in the Ooh, years, right? that's a tougher story than we think, though. Right. It's been just during the war, 1780. Well, it's, it's, but it's yeah. still contested. It's very contested. It's very contested. New York doesn't do it. Yeah, it yeah, goes yeah. down in New Jersey. It goes down in New York. I think that's a, that's a harder story. I think part of one of the reasons why is because they have um, uh, they have this counter -argue. I mean, if you look at some of the anti-gradual emancipation essays that are written in 1780 uh, in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania, a lot of them refer to the British involving what will happen to what will happen to freed slaves in the middle of this war. This is a danger to the their internal enemies. They're a danger to the state. Um, so Massachusetts doesn't do it by statute. No, they don't. No, some people are still being held slavery thing. in the early. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's, that's right. Thing. That's I think it's a tougher story than we thought. I, I'm not to say that it doesn't happen. And I also, and I also think that one of the reasons it does happen is because you can tap into this other discourse about what are we fighting for, right? Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, um, yeah, there is a northern, and, and there are, you know, there's a whole sort of group of people who are writing stuff about maybe saying that I'm wrong, that, that, that there's a very significant and emboldened abolitionist movement. Um, most of them are Jim Oak students and, and Kevin, but, uh, but, <laughs> well, I, mean, I, would, yeah. I don't disagree. My, my point was that the cultural milieus have staying power. And it doesn't stay very long and very prosperous, at least in, in part in some, in some of the northern states, right? Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Rhode Island in particular. Um, it doesn't necessarily stay so long. I don't subscribe to this belief that the revolution, that revolutionary ideology creates an abolitionist movement. It's work on the ground that yeah, I agree. work on the ground and, and by abolitionists that seize it and push it that, that yeah. make it yes. happen. But, Cultural community still have staying power, and they reject it. And there's no, I mean, for Rhode Island, there's no debate over the the um, gradual emancipation statute. The Quakers propose it in January, and it's law by February. Yeah, yeah. That's the easiest. Is the easiest role? Is that right? Do they, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's it's very quick in Rhode Island, and if there is disagreement, it's not the new Porter Files papers. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Can maybe time for one more question. Uh, someone hasn't had a chance to. <laughs> yeah. Um, in looking at the exchanges, are there particular colonies that originate a lot of these stories, or are they more mm. all over the place? So this is one of the things that I did map, right? Because I looked at, so one of the things I did, I, we have, so I have this, I spent a long time writing what became chapter one. And actually, I started writing chapter one in like 2005, and I needed the internet to grow up for me to figure it out. Because we had, so I wrote it between 2005 and 2015. <laughs> Not all the time, although it felt like all the time. So I, I, so I didn't, so we had these subscri subscription books from one newspaper, the Pennsylvania Journal. And I spent a long time uh, met and, and figuring out who all these people were. I actually had dreams of trying to figure out who all the subscribers really were, <laughs> which would have taken me another 10 years and I never would have found them all, but I tried to figure out who all these subscribers were. We, there was about a thousand or so, give or take. And they actually go up as the war gets closer and starts going on. The, 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 it's, war is good for, for newspaper business, isn't it? Um, so I, and the subscription book was actually, um, it took me a long time to figure this out, but it, it moves from, um, 
there's two books. The first one is about just kind of places, and the second one is about delivery routes. And it took me a long time to figure out that those are delivery routes, so I had to map everything. And so, and, but I had to find all these little silly towns all over, and they're like four middle town Pennsylvanias, by the way, which is thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot. Like, I guess we just, let's call this, I don't know, the middle, right? <laughs> So figuring out where the places were, that's when I needed the internet to grow up. So I could, I could go online and I could figure out all these, um, um, go on these, like I needed local archives to upload their stuff so I could figure out where everything was. Right? Where is, um, oh, where is Octorara, right? I had a far, just a hard time finding all these places. And once I did, I, I was able to look at delivery routes that way. But the second thing I then did was I took, 1775 in the Pennsylvania Journal, and I wrote down everything that was in the paper. Every single, how many servant ads, how many slave runaway ads, how much land for sale, and I, and so, and I wanted to look at was, how is the news changing? And one of the things I found was, London news starts to go down, and starting around the summer of 1775, and then we see a lot more news from other places that had never gotten any coverage before. So. So when there was one or two stories from Charleston, South Carolina in the beginning of 1775. By the end, it's like once every week. There's one or two every week. So you're seeing a diversification of where they're getting the news from as the war changes. And much, much more from the American colonies, a lot less from Europe. And you're starting to see more and more um, stuff pop up that you never saw before um, from different places. Um, yeah, yeah, Pennsylvania and New York have a kind of a symbiotic relationship. Um, uh, Annapolis and Williamsburg kind of do. There's a lot of stuff that appears in both. But like Newport showing up in Pennsylvania, that was kind of interesting and new. Charleston showing up in Boston, that was something that wasn't happening before. And so, and it was always really interesting to me is the very end of the war, Thomas Paine, uh, uh, in I think it's November of 75, Thomas Paine is the editor of the Pennsylvania Magazine. And he publishes this really lavish two page. Um, map of the Chesapeake that has all the rivers and creeks and islands and everything in it, and he gives like a uh, he gives a, a a long explanation about what Virginia is. Like it has this many towns and that many towns have this many people, and there's this many churches and but like because his readers are learning more about Virginia than they ever had before, and, and 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 I've been giving you all this stuff about all these creeks. Here's where they actually are, right? And so. I thought that was really interesting about kind of upping the American knowledge about each other, um, which they had never really had cause to do before. Yeah. So, yeah. These are preliminary gazetteers. So it's got to be a genre yeah. of, of uh, publications. Gazetteers. I mean, yeah. How you understand the location or the state? Oh. Oh. Here for, yeah. I don't know what the history of gazetteers is about, uh, but I suspect there are very few of them before the revolution and a lot after. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the very famous, uh, you know, Abigail Adams, John Adams um, exchange that before she gets to the Remember the Ladies bits, she talks about, hey, what are Virginia riflemen like? I hear not good things. <laughs> um, are they okay? Right? And then she gets into the, uh, as the law stuff, right? Um, so that's kind of happening a lot. Like, hey, Americans, huh? I guess we're all in this together. Um, so. <laughs> oh, um, uh, Professor Parkinson's. Uh Agreed to stay uh, afterwards and talk to the graduate students in the uh, 7725 class, and other people who want to join in the conversation are welcome as well. Um, let's give a round of applause. For